Welcome to the Unabridged Podcast. I'm Ashley. And this is Jen. Join us for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content to grow your TBR. Sign up for our newsletter to find out more about online book discussions and upcoming events. Find us on Patreon for extra unabridged content. Join us on Instagram and Facebook at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hey everyone, welcome to Unabridged. Today we are talking about our November book club book, Kelly Barnhill's The Girl Who Drank the Moon. Before we get started, we have two things to talk about today. So one, we want to remind you that we are really putting a lot of great content on our Patreon. So we encourage you to check that out. This month, we released a discussion about On the Come Up, the film adaptation of Angie Thomas's book. And we had a lot of fun talking about that movie. And so each month, we release an extra episode on Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com slash unabridged pod to find out more. We also want to let you know that Libro FM is running a great deal for the holidays. They are giving a nice deal on credit bundles. So if you like Libro FM, if you like supporting independent bookstores and businesses, that's a great place to look. Their app is fabulous. They have a lot of great audiobooks. And so, yeah, the affiliate link for that is in the show notes. If you're interested, it would make a wonderful gift if you're trying to get ahead for the holidays. All right. Well, to get started, we are going to do our bookish check-in. Ashley, what are you reading? One of the books I'm reading right now is Matt Haig's The Midnight Library. I had seen this one a lot on Instagram and was interested in reading it. I didn't know much about it at all, including the tone of the book. And recently I had read, I can't remember what I read that I posted, how it made me just feel really warm and fuzzy. And someone recommended this one in light of that for that feeling and tone. And so that was part of why I picked it up was because I didn't know that I was intrigued by it. It always comes up on my recommendations. So clearly I'm reading stuff in the vein of this, but I didn't know anything about it. So I'm only a little ways in, but this book centers on Nora. And at the beginning of the book, it is counting down immediately to her decision to die. And so you see right away the hours leading up to this moment where you know she's going to make this decision. And she is just having a wretched time of it. And it's really... At the beginning, it's staggering for the reader to see how many tiny things happen that it just reminded me a lot of how you never know what someone's going through and all it takes is reacting in a more gracious way to have a big effect on people. So you just see a lot of relatively minor interactions, but each one of them is just compounding on this feeling that she has of desperation, of feeling like she can't, you know, she just wants to escape. She doesn't. So her cat dies, and that is really awful for her. And it's awful because she's really sad about her cat, but she also felt responsible. You can tell that she, like, feels responsibility for she the cat's in the road, so she feels like she made this, you know, she made it happen by not being a good enough owner, and then she loses her job shortly after that, and just, you know, a slew of things are happening. So very quickly after that, she finds herself in what is called the Midnight Library, and it is a space that seems to be kind of an in-between, and so it has all of these books. All of them have green covers on them. There is a whole bunch of variety as far as like how big they are and and things like that, but all of them look the same otherwise. And there is a librarian who very much resembles her childhood librarian, Mrs. Elm. And so she gets there and can't quite figure out what's happening. And we find out pretty quickly that it is a documentation of all the different parallel lives starting from that moment. So everything in there is a way of continuing her current life, but having made a different decision. And so it's really fascinating. So I really am interested in the premise and 
pretty quickly, she starts unpacking some of the things that she most regrets. And you find out very quickly how those things would have gone. And as you might imagine, those lives play out in very different ways than what she thought in her own timeline. And so I really am fascinated by it. I think it's an interesting premise. And I am curious to see where it goes from here, but I'm loving it. So again, that's Matt Haig's The Midnight Library. I have seen that book everywhere, of course, and just books by him. I know he people really love his nonfiction too. So yeah, this is one I've had on my TBR, my loose TBR, my wish list forever. Yes. Sadly, I did not actually know what it was about. <laughs> so. I mean, that's how I was. Too. I had no idea. I mean, I actually had no idea. But it is one that I had gotten the print copy from the library. And I think I've talked on here before about how I just don't read. I mean, I really have moved away from print books. And I hate that. But I just have found I just don't pick them up. I read at night. I read on my e-reader. and Or I listen to audiobooks. And so I've just gotten away from it. But it was one of those where once I opened the book, immediately I was really sucked in. So I do think it really grabs your attention right away. And yeah. I'm, I'm really loving it. It is intriguing. What about you, Jen? What are you reading? So I am reading Oliver Berkman's 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals. And this one has been on my list for a long time because of Jeff and Rebecca at Book Riot, the podcast. They absolutely love this book. And the audio was available at Scribd. So I was like, hey, why not? It's pretty short. And yeah, it is really good. So it starts with the premise that... We have about 4,000 weeks if we live to be 80 in our lives. And that all of this idea that you can make more time or that you can reach this mythical work-life balance if you just do things the right way it is just false. And so Berkman is, he talks about himself sort of as a reformed productivity person who was really all in on all of these different productivity hacks. And he would read all the books and then he would try all the all the things that they recommended and all of these different ways of organizing your day to make more time. And, and then he just realized it was not working. And so a lot of, I, I'm not finished yet, of course, but a lot of what he does at the beginning is just say, here are all the things that you've been told, that we've been told about how to be more productive And here's why those things are just inherently false. Like you cannot create more time. Efficiency doesn't fix anything. Inbox zero just means that you're creating more email because every time you send an email, you're probably going to get a response. And actually people who don't respond to email end up getting less email. And so that's, yeah. So he just goes through all of these things, which I have to say, I have been quite susceptible to and talks about why, They don't make sense. You know, he talks about the whole metaphor of you have a jar that's your life. And if you put the big rocks in first and those represent the most important things, and then you put the sand and the pebbles in later, those are the less important things you can fit more in. And he's like, but what if you have more big rocks than fit in the jar? Like, what if you have more important things in your life than fit in the jar? What do you do then? And so, yeah, I I found it to be really just an illuminating reframing of the way to think about our lives. I do think this is one that it'll probably take more than one read to process. I like that it's not just like five step plan to making your life, you know, it's like really (laughs) acknowledging the complexity. He talks a lot about philosophy. And, you know, he's he references kids shows, he's really pulling from a lot of different sources to make his point. So I'm really enjoying it so far. And I can see why Jeff and Rebecca are big fans, because it is not about a simple solution to something we all know is really complicated. It's really about thinking about time in a different way. So yeah, I'm really enjoying it. That is Oliver Berkman's 4000 weeks time management for mortals. Oh, wow. I got to check that one out, Jen. Yeah, I think you would really like it. I again, I feel like I feel like it's one of those things we need constant reminders of because anytime I feel like I've reached clarity in how to (laughs) structure my life, you know, it's easy to get swept up and forget about the epiphany that you've had. So I think this is one that would be worth reading more than once, but it's well done. Oh, and he reads the audio, which, and he does a great job, which I enjoy as well. 
All right. Well, we are going to shift into our discussion of the girl who drank the moon. I am reading the publisher's synopsis today. So the girl who drank the moon is about this. Every year, the people of the protectorate leave a baby as an offering to the witch who lives in the forest. They hope this sacrifice will keep her from terrorizing their town. But the witch in the forest, Zan, is kind. She shares her home with a wise swamp monster and a perfectly tiny dragon. Zan rescues the children and delivers them to welcoming families on the other side of the forest, nourishing the babies with starlight on the journey. One year, Zan accidentally feeds a baby moonlight instead of starlight, filling the ordinary child with extraordinary magic. Zan decides she must raise this girl, whom she calls Luna, as her own. As Luna's 13th birthday approaches, her magic begins to emerge with dangerous consequences. Meanwhile, a young man from the Protectorate is determined to free his people by killing the witch. Deadly birds with uncertain intentions flock nearby. A volcano, quiet for centuries, rumbles just beneath the Earth's surface. And the woman with the tiger's heart is on the prowl. All right. Well, we are going to start with our overall impressions. Ashley, what did you think? I unabashedly love this one. (laughs) (laughs) This was a reread for me, and I definitely have mentioned it to Jen many times, and this time made it our book club so that I could talk with Jen about this book. And then I had that feeling of that we all have as readers, where we have recommended a book dear to our heart to our dear friend, and we're like, what if they don't like it? <laughs> and so I had some of that when I was rereading this time. So I'll be very excited to hear. I do not know what Jen thought, so I'll be excited to hear what she thought. But I I absolutely love it. I think that I loved it as much the second time we've talked before about rereadings and how you never know if the book just hit you right because it was the right time. But rereading it, I felt all of the same feelings. I just think it is a beautiful coming of age story. I am captivated by the way that Barnhill shows how complex life is and that a lot of the things that we do to protect the people we love have these consequences that we don't anticipate and that we have to find our way through those. And so I think we see that. And then I also think that we see how societal norms pervade in our lives. I mean, a lot of what you were just saying, Jen, about your nonfiction book about this, like, we don't even realize how entrenched some ways of thought are in our lives and the things we accept. And so that's what I really love about the protectorate specifically, is how we see that for everyone there, this horrific thing happens, and it happens every year. And yet everyone has accepted that. But because of it, the entire society is in this fog of sadness and grief and it weighs on them and yet it's their norm. And so I just think all that is really fascinating also. And and I love all the magical parts. I mean, I, I love Glurk and Furion and Zan and I love the sweet family that they've made together and the way that they bring in Luna and how she becomes their family. I just I love all that also. What about you, Jen? What I'm so curious to hear. What's your overall impression? You can put yourself at ease. I did love it. So I read this one on print. I intended to listen to the audio and I couldn't get it in time for our book club episode. And so, yeah, I read the print and I'm really glad I did. I, I thought I was able to really pay attention to the beauty of the writing. But what sticks with me when I think back on the book as a whole is just this kindness and this generosity of spirit that pervades the book. And I think it's just really lovely. Like, I want my boys to read it. I think there are horrible things that happen. And yet there's always this sense of hope that runs through it that I really, really loved. And we'll get into, I I thought of so many other books and works that I have read, um, a short story. I kept thinking of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. And I recently reread that for a buddy read. And I was like, oh my goodness, the parallels between these things that we just accept that are based in cruelty, but it's just the way we've always done things and the way that people can use fear to stop people from asking questions. And I I thought there were a lot of deeper questions that were part of the book that really are relevant, which I loved. I think it's such a great children's book because it treats children as people who are thinking and wondering about the world around them. It's so respectful to their ability to ask these big questions. So yeah, I really, I loved it. It was really good. (laughs) All right, well, we are going to 
you know, narrow down to just one thing that worked for us. Ashley, what's one thing that worked for you? I think that something that really worked for me, I mean, again, I have a long list. I really Mm -hmm. love this book. And I read it the print this time. Well, I did listen to a little bit of it, actually. I went back and forth. But the first time I listened to the audio entirely, which I absolutely loved. And then this time I read the print, also great. And like Jen said, I got to see, you know, appreciate the writing in a way that's a little bit harder to do when you listen to the audio. But for those of you who are listening who love audiobooks, this one is very well done. So it's a lot of fun to listen. And if you want to do it with kids, this is a really fun one to do on audio with children. But one thing I want to narrow down to is Zan and just talk about her. I think that number one, I absolutely love how she is the witch in the woods and she is nothing like the stereotypes that have always come with women who have magic, women who are in power, women who have the ability to make change in the world. I think that we see Barnhill striking against that stereotype, and yet she's contrasted by the Sorrow Eater, who is a horrific witch who does exactly the things that traditionally and historically fairy tales have told us witches do. And so I think we see that. But again, again, like Jen said, she's part of the societal structure that she's serving herself, but she's also serving a society that lifts up a few at the expense of the many. And so we see that happening. But yeah, I want to talk about Zan that I just... What I love about her so much is her endless compassion and kindness and the way that she's able to see all the sides of things and that she's doing her best all the time, but also understands the limitation of that best. And so, you know, we really see that with Luna when she holds her magic inside her and then all of a sudden it has these disastrous consequences for Luna's well-being and she has to find a way to live with that and so I think you know we really see it there I think we also see it with the with the star children and I think all of that is again such a beautiful story that like this horrific thing happens and yet the other towns are always waiting for this day and waiting for the child who gets selected and the family and how they come to love them and treat them as honored and precious. And so I just think all of that is really beautiful. But I feel like so much of what I appreciate about the story is her at the center and her feeling that we do what we can do with the time that we have and that there's a time to let go. I think all that's really beautiful also and like really important for children to see that there is a time that life is not endless for reasons and that we don't live for an eternity for a lot of reasons. And, you know, so I think that we see that part too with her. So yeah, I just, I wanted to, it's hard for me to narrow it down, but that the storyline that connects with her, I just think is really rich and I love all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- I agree. I she, she was really a revelation and it's interesting because I've read several witchy books recently and so I feel like I love this attempt to look at these stereotypes of women differently and she is such a fun character and when she turns herself into the sparrow and is desperately trying to get to this next baby who she knows she's going to be late for, but she, yeah. And and she does not understand the fact that she does not understand what is happening, that just mysteriously there's this baby left in a circle of trees every year. And she has just given herself this duty of saving that baby without any understanding of the part that her mythology plays in the leaving of the baby. I, the construction of the book is just really, really strong. And her mission, her self, you know, bestowed mission so yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Jen? What's something that worked for you? I'm really torn. I really want to talk about Glurk and I really want to talk about Antane. I'm in favor of both. You lean in on one and we'll talk about the other one too. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. That sounds good. So I loved Glurk so much because again, you're taking this idea of a trope of, of this archetype and just turning it on its head. So Glurk is this huge, ugly bog monster who is also a poet and also a creator and also incredibly kind even though Glurk tries to be really grumpy and tough and I love watching Glurk and Furion's interactions and the way Glurk knows all of these things about Furion or thinks you know thinks they know all these things about Furion that maybe aren't true and yet 
chooses to treat Furion in a kind way so as not, not to break the poor little dragon's heart. And I just think that that constant reminder, once we figure out that Glurk is the poet who's behind all of these poems that help us to understand the world and can help people understand greater truths is such a nice pairing. Just that juxtaposition of, I think Glurk has six legs and, you know, the descriptions make it clear that Glurk is not fitting anyone's definition of beauty. (laughs) And yet Glurk has a beautiful soul. And so I just really loved that character It almost makes me want an adaptation of this, although I think an adaptation could never capture the magic of this book. But I would love to see how artists would portray Glurk because I think Glurk would be a really fun, like it would be a great artistic prompt to give someone all the descriptions of Glurk through the book and just see what they came up with. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, I I love him also and Furion. And yeah, that relationship, I just think it's all really sweet. What do you want to say about Antine? I just really loved Antine too. Because again, right, the trope is here's this hero, this warrior who's going to save everyone from the witch. That's the outline of what happens toward the end of the book. And yet Antine, again, is rooted in kindness, is rooted in love, is rooted in trying to do the right thing. He's just trying to be happy and live a life with his wife and his baby He doesn't care about the privilege and the wealth that his mother so desperately wants him to have. So he goes along with what she wants for a really long time. When he becomes scarred, he's aware of it and a little self-conscious of it, but only because other people are self-conscious of it. And so this whole notion of handsomeness and ugliness, I think, is, is complicated. And I just think, you know, his final mission to go out and kill the witch is based on false knowledge. He's trying to do something very, very brave. And then you see the way it all turns out. And it's just lovely. So, yeah, I just thought, again, Barnhill is so clever at taking these fairy tale tropes and these heroic tropes and, you know, the whole idea of these quests and showing that they can be really complicated when real people are at their center. So, yeah, I really love that one, too. Yeah, and I thought his relationship with Athene was really showed that even things that seem really horrific, like the scarring of his face, have consequences that can be really great. And that, you know, they they can have these results that can be so unanticipated and that, you know, we see there. And I loved Athene when, when she realizes that Sister Ignatia is away from the tower. She is also, you know, fiercely brave and ready to take action. And I think that we see them both seizing the moment to bring about change. And so I love that also, because I just think that what we said, you know, the societal norms and everyone accepts them. And that's part of how they function is Mm -hmm. because everyone accepts them. And if people didn't, they wouldn't function. And so we see that when the two of them take that moment each takes action, then it does bring about this, you know, enormous change. Yes. Watching her deal with Antane's uncle is just one of my favorite (laughs) moments. And he is so horrible, not just because he's evil, but because he is weak. And just it is his weakness and his susceptibility to temptation and his unwillingness to give up even a bit of his power that makes him perpetuate this horrible system. And so, yeah, I think, you know, he could turn out to be a decent member of society, but he needs someone to tell him no and to confront him. And Antane tries when he's younger, but he just is too young at that time to be able to make a real change. But yeah, I love that scene when Athene is just like brushing him off (laughs) in in the most polite way possible. Um, It was really fun. Yeah. Yeah, and that there's nothing for Garland. He doesn't want to give up his luxuries at any cost. And so he, he will sacrifice even his nephew, whom we know he loves. Yes. He will sacrifice that. He will sacrifice the nephew's baby. I mean, that he's willing to. And also it's that idea for him that 
any kind of affection is a weakness. And so it's, you know, the total misunderstanding of what matters and what and the values. And that's part of what makes him so awful. Well, And the idea that he thinks he's controlling these people. And in a way he is, but he's also being controlled by those things he put in place. Absolutely. And he has no freedom to act outside of them. So his his bid for power and control has as much of a detrimental effect on him as it does any of the people in the in the town. Yes, absolutely. And I think one other thing, just as far as the tropes and maybe how things are handled differently in this story than a lot of them, I loved how even in the end, like they took care of Sister Ignatia and they brought her back and like Zan and her share the room. And so I really appreciated that because I think so often a lot of our myths and legends traditionally have something horrible happens to the bad person and that's how things get resolved is by you know i mean I think about all the disney movies where they like fall off a cliff or something so right. you know that the quote-unquote good person didn't do anything to the quote-unquote bad person but miraculously the bad right. person <laughs> is cast into a pit typically and suddenly you know all everything changes and instead in this there's really a questioning of that and an idea that power structures can change. And it doesn't mean that something horrific has to happen to that person in power. It just takes a shift in those societal norms to bring about a change where they no longer have the power to do the horrific things. And that doesn't mean anything terrible has to happen to them. And I think that protects our ideas of Zan and Glurk and Luna, you know, we're able to see in Antane, I mean, we're able to see all of them as being consistent with their character of being gracious and compassionate and all those things, because they even amidst these horrific things, they still are protecting and and also the unpacking of the sor- sorrow eater and why she became what she was and not making a justification for these horrific things that she's done for the last 500 years. But giving a sense of the complexity of what makes someone what they are. So much to unpack. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, we are going to move on to our quotation section. Ashley, what's one quotation you would like to discuss? Oh, I had a really hard time choosing one. I wanted to pick the section where Furion (laughs) is suddenly not a perfectly tiny dragon, but is becoming the enormous dragon that he always thought that he was. And so I think there's two things I really loved about that. One, I love the idea that, again, to protect, Zan never told Furion the truth. And so Furion's whole life, he believes that everyone around him is a giant. And that's why he seems so small in comparison, which is ridiculous, but also hilarious and speaks to this idea that, again, we... I think that there's a questioning in the book of the fact that we hide things from people, particularly those that we see as being, uh, you know, like we are mentors or caretakers of them. That like we try to protect them, but we protect them by not telling them the truth and then the consequences of that. And so I think we see that a lot. But anyway, so Furion's body is changing in very drastic and not very becoming ways. And at at an inconvenient time. And he and Glurk are having a conversation and he wants to know what's happening to him. And so he's starting to understand that no no one around him was a giant and that, in fact, he has been very, very tiny, but big of heart is the way that Glurk says it. And so Furion is asking Glurk about this. And Glurk says, I don't know, my dear Furion. So he, he asks, what does that mean, right? All these things that are happening, like, what does this mean? And Glurk says, I don't know, my dear Furion. What I do know is that I'm here with you. I do know that the gaps in our knowledge will soon be revealed and filled in. And that is a good thing. I do know that you are my friend and that I will stand by your side through every transition and trial. No matter how Furion's rump suddenly doubled in size, its weight so extreme that his back legs buckled and he sat down with a tremendous crash. No matter how indelicate. (laughs) Glurk finished. And like, I, I just, I just love that because I feel like Glurk is so wise, but even Glurk doesn't have all the answers. And Glurk is willing to admit that and willing to say that he doesn't know and that we learn more as we go and that he'll stay by his friend's side. And so I just thought that was really beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was one I picked. I love that too. <laughs> what about you, Jen? What's your choice? 
Yeah, I marked so many quotations in this book. I chose one centered on books and libraries. And so this is when Athene is going to the tower where the sisters live. And, you know, we learn early on that one of the reasons Antane and Athene want to work in the tower and learn in the tower is because that's where the books are. That's where the knowledge is and that they hope they're going to get access to it, which, of course, it's it's very closed off. So they're sent away before they would be able to have access to it. So this is the moment when Athene is telling Antine's younger brother that they're opening it up. And she says, the tower is meant to be a center for learning, not a tool of tyranny. Today, the doors are opening. Even to the library, Wynne said, hopefully, especially the library. Knowledge is powerful, but it is a terrible power when it is hoarded and hidden. Today, knowledge is for everyone. And I just think, you know, as book lovers, we all believe this. We believe that knowledge is there for everyone and that accessing knowledge is a good thing. And to see this be a key part of the opening up of the town and of the moving past these really damaging beliefs that have been perpetuated by the people in power by restricting other people's access to knowledge. I just loved so much about that. And I think we see throughout the book the way that restriction of access to knowledge is part of the way that the people in control maintain that control. And so I just thought that was really brilliant through the whole book. And I loved this moment. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, this was really tough for me, but we are each going to recommend a pairing. And yeah, Ashley, what are you recommending? Yeah, I thought of a bunch. I mean, like Jen said, I think that like a good book that that has some questioning of some, you know, a lot of different traditional tropes. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to go here, but I am going to recommend Tay Keller's When You Trap a Tiger. And this one was recommended to me by some of the unabridged ambassadors. So thank you for that. I absolutely, this was another five star read for me. And this one centers on Lily. And she, at the beginning of the story, she and her family, her mother and her sister, they're all going to live with her sick grandmother. Her grandmother, her hominy, is Korean. And so and very tied to Korean folklore. And so a lot of what Lily remembers is some of the stories that connect to being with her grandmother. And so right as she's going, her family's making this transition. She sees a tiger from the stories that her grandmother had always told her as a young child in the middle of the road. And all of a sudden there is this, pathway toward her trying to figure out how to manage the folklore that has come to life and how to figure out what to do about that. And I think that what I think is so beautiful is this is another story that really focuses on our desire to protect each other and the way that we want to care for the people that we love, but how there are things that we, there are limitations. There are always limitations. And so Lily is trying to figure out how to work a deal with this tiger so that if she can sort out this thing that went awry, that Hominy did wrong basically a long time back, that if she can rectify that, then she can heal her grandmother. And but as she knows from the folklore, the tigers are slippery and the things that they say are not always to be trusted. And so there's a lot of that. Um, and also, like, there's the there's a lot of questioning of, like, the skeptic approach versus the embracing approach. And so we really see that contrast between the mother and the grandmother. And so Lily is kind of caught in the middle of that also of, like, you know, what is the way to see the world? And so I just think it's such a beautiful story and really weaves some of the kind of mythical elements in with the regular world, our world. And so I just think all that's really beautiful. And I think it's a nice pairing because it has a lot of complementary aspects. And also tender examination of relationships between children and their grandparents. So again, that's Tay Keller's When You Trap a Tiger. That sounds so good. That one's on my list also. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good one. You would love it. Uh, Jen, what's your pairing? 
I really had a debate here whether to go. There were several dragon books that popped up into my head, like dragon-centered books. But I think ultimately I'm going to go with Melissa Albert's Our Crooked Hearts, which I just read with the Totally Teen Buddy read. And so Melissa Albert also wrote the Hazelwood duology. I still haven't read the second book. And that is similarly this magic-filled world centered on stories. But Our Crooked Hearts is really interesting. It took me, I had forgotten that this was the same author as the Hazel Wood. And then it came to me later in the book. So Our Crooked Hearts seems as if it's about this conflict between Ivy, who is 17, and her mother, who just seems both very removed and also very controlling of her daughter's life. And what eventually becomes apparent is that Ivy's mother has control over magic and that Ivy maybe does too, but that is not something she has ever been allowed to know. And this is one I I keep hesitating because Even that much, I feel like is sort of a spoiler, but I also feel like you have to know that for me to talk about this book as having a parallel with The Girl Who Drank the Moon. And so I think both stories, Our Crooked Hearts is written for a YA audience, but just like The Girl Who Drank the Moon, both books talk about what it is like to be a parent who is caring for a daughter with great power. And how you both enable that power, but also protect them from making bad decisions with that power. Just like the girl who drank the moon, I feel like the child's perspective is a huge part of it. In our crooked hearts, it alternates between Ivy's perspective and her mom's point of view. And yet, as a parent, the part that resonated with me is how do we make decisions with the right thing to do for our children to enable them to step into who they can be, but also to protect them from all of the things that can be perilous about that. And so, yeah, I I kept seeing parallels, even though the, I, I think the tones are very different. I think our crooked hearts doesn't have that same magical fairy tale feel that is, is runs through the girl who drank the moon. And yet I think some of the questions that it is asking are very similar. So I really loved it. I was blown away by it. And so I would highly recommend Melissa Albert's Our Crooked Hearts for those of you who like both children's lit and YA lit and you want to see different treatments of a similar storyline. Yeah, that one sounds great. And it was making me think we did not talk about Luna's mom in our discussion, which is okay. But I just wanted to tack on that I loved that whole storyline as Mm -hmm. well and just how it shows that what can seem to be madness is often mislabeled and can be tied up with grief and that there is power in suffering mm-hmm. and that there are things, again, kind of like with Antine's injury to his face, which of course is all tied up with the mother, you know, but that there can be that not everything that comes out of that kind of situation is always bad. Mm -hmm. And so even though, of course, for the community, they needed to bring about change, it just kind of, yeah, harkens to the idea that compassion and love go a long way toward healing and Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, things aren't always what they seem. I just think there's a lot of that with that. Yeah. With her mom. Yeah. That whole, the whole part when the, the people are in the protectorate are being reunited with their children is such a beautiful part. And just that whole idea of the fact that of course they're sad that they missed out on those many years with their children, but they're also so glad to see that they had happy lives and, and weren't dead. I mean, right. Right. On the most base level, but also that they had happy lives and to be grateful for that while also acknowledging the grief of not having lived with them. Anyway, it's a really nuanced book. Yeah. It's really, yeah. Yeah, and that even when Adara lives with Luna and all of them, that that still, it's not, she's not suddenly all entirely cured, quote unquote cured. You know, I think I loved that also, that like, life is complicated, and that trauma doesn't immediately disappear. And that even if there's a beautiful resolution, that that resolution doesn't mean that all those things go away. I thought I just loved all of that. I thought, yeah, like you said, I think it's really nuanced. And there's a lot that you can unpack in the different characters. But 
All right. Well, how many bookish hearts? I know the answer to this already. How many bookish hearts would you give it, Ashley? Well, I showed my cards at the beginning by saying that I was worried about whether you would like it. So yeah, definitely five. I love this one. I think it's a beautiful book. Yeah, what about five, you? Five for me as well. All right. Well, we are going to wrap up today with our Give Me One. And this is morning or night. Are you a morning person or a night person, Ashley? Yeah. So for a lot of my life, I thought that I was a night person. My family stayed up late and I stayed up late as a kid. But surprise, surprise, I'm a morning person for sure. I'm definitely, if I think about just like mental state, productivity, (laughs) all those kind of indicators of what is, when is your best time? I have to say morning for me. What about you, Jen? Yeah, I feel like this is complicated for me. And my answer is different during the school year versus the summer. My default, what I would rather do is stay up later and get up later. And then but my life means that I need to go to bed a little earlier and get up very early. I I am more productive in the morning, usually. But I think that's driven more by circumstance than preference. So I I don't I don't know. (laughs) There is a point at night at which I just cannot function anymore. And, you know, so I'll read, but I can't grade past a certain hour and I can't create things past a certain hour. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's that makes sense. That's what, I mean, my life partner, I feel like the night is definitely when he does a lot of his writing mm-hmm. and things like that. And that is just not me. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what I've realized over time is just that. There are things I can do at night, but as far as things that require a lot of creativity and and creating, you know, any kind of content, that I definitely have to do that in the morning. That's not something I do well at night. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for listening. We would love to know what you thought of The Girl Who Drank the Moon. And if you have any books you would recommend as a pairing for this one, I'd love to add to my TBR. Thanks again for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged. Unabridged.